I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. My name is Ben Kogel, and I am Mother Allison's fiance. I just completed my second year of seminary at Swanee. If you missed it, I was with you all a month ago, and I am glad to be with you all again this Sunday, albeit in this digital format. I have to confess, I spent most of this week trying as hard as I could to wrap the biblical texts in a nice, neat, pleasant Father's Day sermon. Unfortunately, I could not. The Spirit has convicted me, as perhaps it has you in recent days, and everywhere I turned to in reading this text has backed it up. There is not a pretty or neat or nice sermon that I can offer this morning. Jesus' words are difficult to hear, they are difficult to swallow, and they make many people turn away. Jesus is no stranger to saying difficult sayings. Because of this, many of his disciples turned away and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Matthew's Gospel this morning is poignant. Where it mentions fathers, it does not mention courage, loyalty, steadfastness, kindness, strength, or any of the other characteristics that we associate with our fathers. Instead, Jesus says, For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Christ, the Prince of Peace, proclaims that he is not here to bring peace but the sword. Following Christ will turn fathers against sons and mothers against daughters. Conversely, following Christ can turn sons against fathers and daughters against mothers just as quickly. Unless they love Jesus more than them, unless all of the households make some sacrifices. There is nothing nice or pretty to be said about this. We can only ignore it or we can engage with it. So let's engage it. Looking at our world today from our corner of the church, I bet we would not have to look far to find family relationships disrupted because of the state of things. In her truest moments, our church stands with Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and Ahmaud Arbery. Our presiding bishop has made racial reconciliation a top priority for years, and our diocese has brought about a capital campaign to support two churches in historically black neighborhoods in Louisville. Yet our church has fallen short many more times. We have upheld the status quo far more than we have challenged it. The gospel calls us to love our neighbor, and in this generation at this time, for the majority of us who are white, that first means listening to those who cry out for justice, educating ourselves but it concurrently means taking action, whether that is participating in a protest, connecting to our political leaders, voting, or posting on social media. Worst of all, it means speaking to friends and family, those closest to us who sometimes end up with different points of view. No matter how much we educate ourselves on these issues, we can be made to feel small in a second by a dismissive comment or a misunderstanding with someone close. I've been there. I've felt that. Yet, at the core of Christ's teaching is love for our neighbors, all of our neighbors. When Jesus was alive, he did not make a diversity list and heal the correct percentage of people in every category. No, he went first to those most ostracized and those most in need of healing. He pursued lepers who were cast out of society and healed the blind that were on the margins. He proclaimed the poor as blessed, and he said that they would inherit the kingdom of God. 
our Christian duty is to love those and serve those who need the most. Right now, that is the black community. Black lives matter. And for generations, our country has said that they do not. In many systematized ways, black lives continue to be cast on the margin, despite our attempts to make everything pretty, despite our attempts to say that everything is fine now that we have civil rights or have ended slavery. Everything is not fine. There is nothing nice or pretty to be said about this. We can only ignore it or engage with it. Whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Jesus calls us to engage. Jesus calls us to love our neighbors. And in this case, loving our neighbors puts us squarely on a side in the most divisive political battle in our history as a country. Post about Black Lives Matter and you may offend your relatives or lose friends, but you will also be on the side of love. Having a conversation about loving all of our neighbors, including people of color and those on the margins in society, will drive a sword between those who do not share our convictions. That is what Jesus warns about. The road to the cross is a hard road. Yet, there is also promise. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Christ comes to proclaim the kingdom of God. God cares for the least of these, and the least of these includes us. God's kingdom has room for the poor, the marginalized, for people of color, and white people too. God's kingdom has room for those who have been anti-racist for decades and have been in countless protests, but also those who went on their first march this month. God's kingdom has room too, room for you too. God's kingdom includes all that God draws in, even those who stand unrepentant now, even those who do not hold the same beliefs as us. Because finally, we are not called to convert everyone. The Holy Spirit does that work with our participation. We are not called to fix the broken world, and we frequently find ourselves powerless to do so, even on a small scale. But we are called to witness to the coming of God's kingdom that is breaking in even now, even in 2020. So this Sunday, let us offer gratitude and love for our fathers. We are meant to honor and respect our parents, and they deserve celebration, even though they are imperfect like us. But let us also pray for those who have been separated from their father, their parents, whether by their choice or not. Let us pray for those who have no fathers and for those whose fathers want nothing to do with them. Let us pray for the fathers who have lost children and for the children who have lost their fathers. Finally, let us not put father and mother before God. Instead, through the love of Christ, let us share the love that we have for our families with all our neighbors, with the entire church and with the entire human family. That road is a hard road, which will require endurance, and it will require repentance too when we fall short. The road will not be easy, the cross is not light, but when we give ourselves up to Jesus, we find life. Amen.